what good clinicians in this field do. It separates the kind of hospital-based dietitian, maybe, from the clinical nutrition person, is that person understands those characteristics. And when they sit, they're doing pattern recognition when they're looking at that patient, and they're making all these observations. This is the wisdom of this field. That's why we call it the art right, of healthcare, rather than the science of healthcare. Because you're, there's still no computer that's ever been developed that can be as good in quickly recognizing patterns as the human brain. But you have to know what the patterns are. It's like garbage in, garbage out. So you have to have a good pattern recognition system, which is the training and the experience you have, asking questions. So my answer is there's no lab test, there's no proteomic analysis that will ever beat this. This is this will trump everything. And the better that you get at that, the more extraordinary miracles you will be present for. You know, I can tell you that when you get to my age, the key principle that guides me every day is I want to maximize miracles. I've already been through the training and the diligence and the speaking and the four million miles and all that stuff. What I want to be is present either vicariously or directly for as many miracles as possible. And then I want to replicate those miracles. Once you see them, you ask, how can I make that happen in another person, in another person? And then they become a standard of practice. So where does that start? Really good observation. It doesn't start with a lab test. It starts with really good observation. So that, to me, is the core of a good nutritional curriculum, is to understand that recipe, how you make those observations. Am I okay, Ms. Michelle? <laughs> did, that, did that answer your question, or did I not answer your no, it did. I guess what I'm thinking is that no matter what you're looking at, you're looking at the symptoms and maybe thinking back to, like, say, if someone has their hepatitis and say, well, oh, gosh, well, you know, has something to do with that, or like just making some education. Oh, see, there you go. There you go. Now you're, now you're starting to do it. This is, this is a whole course in logic tree analysis. So you would say, ah, dermatitis. So let's see. What's on my my bibliography for dermatitis. And if you don't remember, you can now go to the computer and you can find it, right? So you'd say, let's see, it could be food allergy, or it could be essential fatty acid deficiency, or it might be magnesium deficiency, or it might be a zinc problem, or it might be uh, related to um, a B vitamin insufficiency. So you start going down this list of this possibility. So you hold that, then you look at the patient, you say, oh, gee, look at their tongue. They have a lot of uh, fissures in their tongue, and they've got, uh, it's a, it's a smooth, low papillae with fissures. Gee whiz, that sounds like a B vitamin deficiency. So now we have a second bit of information. Then you go and you look at their fingernails, and you say, my word, they've got a lot of redness in their cuticles and their nails and a lot of sloughing of, of tissue. That's an iron and vitamin B deficiency. So you're starting to develop a pattern, right? Each step along the way is reinforcing your hypothesis. So it's a detector story. That's what's so exciting about this field. And that's where this field falls short, I think, many times, when it teaches students out of the textbook to somehow recognize tropical diseases and vitamin deficiency. Because these are the skills that you really want to know when you're going to provide service to people that are asking about their own problems. Please. When you summarize all of your clinical findings and you think you have narrowed down you know, the specific nutrient or nutrients that mm -hmm. you think could fix them, when you're dealing with these mega doses, uh, how and when do you draw the line as far as reaching toxicity, taxing out their organs, and, and for how long do you go without seeing change? I mean, is, it, is there a length of time that you continue dosing them? Or? Those are superb questions. Those are like three hour lectures, each one of those <laughs> questions, so, so I'll compress it. First of all, um, and I didn't say this and I should have to begin with, and I apologize, it should be the standard upon which all of this is built. Uh, you can't do what um, was stated in the Life Extension book some years ago that created a big uh, furor on the a big celebrity status on the on television. And this is way before most of your time. There was this book in the, uh, I think it was probably the early 80s, uh, Pearson and Shaw called Life Extension. It was a big tome. And he was very popularized on TV. He's a very good speaker and a smart guy and very kind of uh, idiosyncratic in his dress. And so he was on uh, one of the very popular talk shows at the time on TV. And he was saying, you can eat anything you want as long as you took the right amount of vitamins. And in his books, if you go back and you look at this Life Extension, uh, Sandy Shaw and Dirk Pearson's book, you'll find there's these uh, uh, photographs in the book of them in their house with these 50-gallon uh, barrels of nutritional supplements. I'm serious. 
in which they had their hands dug in like the mother load, right? And, 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 and the concept was, if you eat crappy, just neutralize it with these things. And so there were all these like neutralizing life extension vitamins, and it built the whole industry of, well, actually, that's where life extension that the company came from, and ultimately the A4M, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, were kind of derived out of the Pearson and Shaw book because it was so highly popular. They sold a million copies of the hardback book in a year to show you how popular it was. Well, um, let me just tell you, I don't believe that's true at all. I think the proof of the pudding now some 20 years later is that if you look at uh, Shaw and Pearson, probably you can make your own uh, assessment. Uh, but the bottom line is it starts with a good diet. You have to start with food. Food is where it all starts. And then you add on to that the needs that that person might have individually based upon their health history. So that's my first point. My second point relates to toxicity. Toxicity, um, you know, there are these what are called safe effective ranges uh, that have been established uh, by the Council for Responsible Nutrition and other organizations. You can go and find these. John Hancock published these. He uh, was an expert member of the Food Nutrition Board of the USDA. And um, these um, guidelines give you a fairly broad range. I mean, selenium has a much more narrow range. Vitamin A has a narrow range. Vitamin C has a broad range, right? So you can use these nutrients in those ranges based on good scientific evidence in any theaters of evaluation with, with impunity, with safety. And so I would say stay in those ranges, and if there are other reasons to go out, then you always ask the risk-benefit question, because everything is toxic at some level, even air and water, even love. I think you can, you can over-love a person by becoming codependent and stealing their independence, right? So everything has a balance point, and you have to kind of find where that balance point is. So that's my second. Concept. My third concept, the third question, was really how long does it take? To change, in general, to change fundamental biochemistry takes 12 weeks. So all the programs we try to work with are kind of on the 12 week, three month time zone. That's not a hard and fast rule, but that's kind of a good guideline. So if a patient or client doesn't give you three months of a commitment, don't even go there. If they're going to be frustrated, then you're going to be frustrated. You know, this is qualifying patient and, and patients as to where they are on their um, locus of control model. And if, if they're still struggling and they're looking for a magic rescue that tomorrow's gonna pull them out of the ravages of, of low esteem, uh, and they'll give you one day to do it, forget it. I mean, it, it's just gonna be frustrating and they're gonna come back as being a problem client later. If they're invested to say, I'll give you three months, but I wanna see results, and you say, I'll provide results with the program for results, but it's gonna be your program, I don't own it, you own it, you go home, this is you, not me, and you can have that alliance as working as a team, three months is generally going to do. Other questions, please? What do you see as the biggest challenge in getting us to model our molecular medicine? Did more research need to be done, or do you feel like it's the dissemination of the research? Oh, that's another really good next? question. Um, I used to think that it was research and published papers and you know, I'm kind of a bibliophile, and so I, I always uh, like to shoot out at A Corral, A, -A, -K -A -K Corral, OK Corral, there we go, OK Corral, uh, utilizing references. So I've always believed that the person who has the most references wins at the end of the day. <laughs> but but I, I don't believe that that's true anymore. I think now, because we have more than enough references, it's not like no science. The problem really comes down to economics. And the driver is going to be the change based upon the fact we can't afford this healthcare system we are in right now. You don't even have to have a philosophical position on this anymore. The bottom line is we're bankrupting the country with this present model, and we're not reducing the burden of disease. We are not reducing the burden of disease. In fact, as you know, in 2005, this paper was published in the Journal of Medicine, said that children born today will be the first generation in the history of the United States whose average life expectancy will be likely less than that of their parents. Never before happened. We're spending 37% more per capita on healthcare than any country in the world, and we are 35th in health outcomes based on the World Health Organization. Now, when you put all that together, what's that say? The model is broken. So, by economic reasoning alone, regardless if you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a Socialist, or doesn't really matter. When you bankrupt at the end of the day, you've got to make a change. So, that, that's I think going to be the problem. 